I've been blessed this week. Have you been blessed this week? Amen. I want to just impart something to you before I hand the mic over to Nathan. I'm not going to talk for very long, okay? We, we'll, we're going to be done at a normal time. <laughs> Two preachers with a mic is dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think if I could impart one thing is that uh, you know faith is the substance of things hoped for right and so with every message I believe if it's a God inspired message if it's something from his word if it's something from his will it's imparting hope to your spirit it's imparting hope to your mind okay it's bringing a message of truth, and that truth comes with the hope of the reality of the truth, right? So when they came back from the promised land, and they had the grapes in their hand, and they had the testimony, so it's a land of flowing with milk and honey. Does that not spark hope? I mean, you, you've lived in a desert, <laughs> and here is the message of hope, right? Everybody say hope. And see, but faith is the substance of things hoped for. So hope is a living picture. It's that, um, it's that excitement you feel on the inside. Oh, this is possible, you know. And if anything could, in spite, I, I don't want it to sound like I'm giving the enemy glory. I'm not. <laughs> but uh, we, we talked about it. This, this is like everything that can be thrown is, is being thrown somewhat in my emotions and, and, and just outside things trying to work the storm inside, right? And in spite of all that, I got more hope now than I ever had hope. And see, what is on the outside doesn't determine what's on the inside. Amen? So that hope that's on the inside of you, I don't, when I hear all of the messages, the hope that I'm getting is that there is a living reality of his, an awareness of his presence on a continual basis. If I could put it in a nutshell. It's not confined to your 30 minutes your hour, your 15-minute devotional. It's not as though, okay, God's with me in my prayer closet, and then, and then out and about, he's, uh, he's got to wait for me tomorrow morning. He's, he's with you all the time, amen? He's that hot spot, you know, if your phone's got, you've got your hot spot on. <laughs> and, and see, not only do you receive information from that hot spot, but people around you can, you know, get in there and say, I want to I join up. I need to <laughs> receive something from you. And see, that's the gospel. Because you're supposed to be the access point through which God can flow, a river of living water, okay? So there is this picture of hope. Everybody say hope. hope. Hope that what he's been describing is for you. Everybody say me. So you can have that living reality and awareness of his presence. You wake up and it's you and God. It's not just you anymore. Hallelujah. But without faith... That hope is just going to, like pouring water out, it's without a form, it's just going to be another message you remember, okay? And so, what does faith do? What's the difference between faith and hope? See, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So, hope builds an inspired action of faith. So, this ought to change how you live. Hallelujah. This ought to change how you think. This ought to change how you walk and how you talk and how you address situations. You don't address them by yourself. You address them with him. Amen. So without any faith-inspired change of directions, without any faith-inspired steps, confessions, without any faith inspired words, whatever the case may be, faith gives movement to the hope that's been put inside of you this week. And after he's gone, what's going to be left better not just be the memory of hope. It better be the actions of faith that wakes up in the morning like he's been talking about and saying, praise God, it's you and me. And it's not just you and me in this little bit of time. It's you and me all the time. And let that awareness build and let the hope reinforce your faith and then give more faith and substance to the hope and let it just be a growing cycle of growth on the inside of you. Hallelujah. Until that hot spot gets so strong that everybody in this city can receive something from what's going on in here. Amen. Amen. So faith is the substance of things hoped for. This is going to translate into real 
actions and words on your part. If it does not, it's going to be like a light you remember in the past, and it's just going to get dimmer and dimmer because faith never gave any substance to it. But we're not going to be like that. We're not going to be like that. We're going to let this reality and let this hope in this message change this week. It doesn't have to wait a year. It can change this week in your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, that's the only thing I got to impart this morning. So without any further ado, why don't we all just give Nathan a hand clap as he comes. Thank you, Nathan. Hello, am I on? Good morning, everyone. Oh, it's so good to be here, and I think we're going to have a good wrap-up here this morning. Amen? Amen. And I think we might read the Bible this morning. (laughs) Amen? (laughs) I think. Uh, Let's all just lift our hands and bow our heads real quick. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence that's here, not only around us, but in us, because we're not apart from you, Father. We thank you for that realization, Father, and everything that you want to do this morning. All types of healings, hurts, wounds, physical, perspectives changing, lives changing, everything that you want to do, we give you full reign and authority to do that. In the mighty name of Jesus, and we give you all the glory and praise, and everybody says, Amen. Amen. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 3. And let's just start reading verse 14. It's rare for me when I get to read the Bible. I'm telling you, it excites me. (laughs) For this reason, everybody there say amen. amen. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family... And heaven and earth is named. Everybody say, I'm a part of that family. That he would grant you, everybody say me. me. According to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. That Christ might dwell in our hearts through faith. That we would be rooted and grounded in love. Everybody say love. And that we'd be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, and the depth, and the height to know. Everybody say no. No. Oh, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. That we might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Everybody say that power is in me right now. Everybody say that love's in me right now. Everybody say that union's in me right now. You see, this, this little text here is precious to me because it's describing this intimate uh, knowing. Everybody say no. To know something, you have to get intimately acquainted with it. I've gotten to know my wife. When I got married, you know, I thought I knew her. (laughs) They say that marriage, you know, love is blind, but marriage is an (laughs) eye-opener. You think you know someone. And listen, I'm not saying that in a negative tense. You think you know someone, but then when you get married and you live with them, you start to really know who they are. I've for seven years now, beyond that, because I've known her for about 15 years, we've been getting intimately acquainted. And, and when we say intimate, usually people go into sexual tents, and I'm not really talking about that so much as I am as communion and loving and getting to know each other and spending time together. Everybody say time. You see, I don't, I love being around my wife. Some people don't like to be home because they don't like their spouse, you know. And I understand some people are in some really rough situations with their spouse. And and it's not always God's will for you to stay in that situation, you know. Amen? Amen. Oh, amen. And I'm talking when it comes to things like adultery and things that have happened, you know, that there is divorce in the Bible and it, it is okay. 
It's okay to stand and fight for your marriage, but it's also okay for it to... Oh, that's another topic. Somebody say glory. <laughs> but this union between me and my wife and, and me getting to know her and fall in love with her more, that I like to be around her. But it's because the more I spend time with her, the more I fall in love with her, the more I commune with her, the more we're always talking about things. We, we talk all the time. Communion is so important for a relationship to thrive. If you're not continually pouring into communion and investment into people and not even spouses but relational, the body of Christ, you know, it's, we like to reserve and, and, and go into our own little pocket where it's just us and then we like to block the rest of the world out. But the gospel is all about this openness of community where beyond ourselves we start to invest in other people but knowing that they invest back into us and there's this open street. But it cannot happen with an openness of fellowship communion well I love my wife now more than I thought I did when I got married to her but it's because I continually invest everybody say invest to know her that there's a love that I have for her and that she has for me and we constantly feed into that and when things are going wrong in our marriage and we're starting to side up with the list of you did this and you did this, I know it's because we're not feeding our intimacy and communion. We're starting to kind of, oh, you know, drift apart and start to do the blame game. It's because we're not talking about things and working through them. You guys following me? Well, to know the love of Christ works exactly the same way. And it's a love that passes knowledge. You could read about it all day long, that God loves you. Listen, God is love. God is love. He is nothing else. God is the sum total of love. And listen, as He is, so are you in this world. You are love. That means your love right now loves in you. You have the power plan of love, but there's this way that you could develop into that more, not starting from a standpoint of not having it, though. Uh, when we use words like develop and growth and, and maturity, most people think they go from a state of not having to having. And I want us to get that thought out of our brain. Because when you got born again, you actually became a new creature. You were in union with God. There was a unity that started in you where you weren't lacking Him. And he is what is wanting to fulfill you, but he's already in you. And the only way he can fill you with that love is through intimate relationship with him. And that cannot happen with daily communion. But to know the love of Christ and God that would surpass all knowledge of you knowing to be able to say it. That I know, you know, God loves me. God loves me. But there's a way that you can experience that love. And listen, in a real experience relationship with that love, it completely demolishes your perspective about life. Because you look at it in such a different way. When I've come to find that worship, everybody say worship. It has everything to do with this direct connection between who's in me and how I'm in him. Because worship is a love expression. Father, I love you. I love you. Listen, I spend time in worship all the time. Me and Sam were driving to church today and on the way I'm in and out of song. Father, I love you. I'm saying it. Listen, I'm comfortable around him. He's comfortable around me. He doesn't get offended. He starts worshiping with me. <laughs> I'm in and out of it in my walk with God because I'm in this daily communion of saying, Father, I love you. I love you because, listen, my heart really does love him. I love him. But in that, there's a rapport that's going on inside of me where he's constantly expressing the love that's in me for me to see it so that I could be it. And that no matter what happens in my life, that I'm being constantly filled with the fullness of God through my daily communion with him to where I'm not in a state of lacking I'm fulfilled, and I'm not looking for you to give me anything that's going to make me feel better about myself. I'm looking to him, and he's fulfilling me. Then I could look to you, and I could love you regardless of what you do. I could then look to my spouse and love them regardless of what they do. And I don't go into the list and the blame game of why I have the right, why I have the right to reserve. Because God is not in justice in a sense. And listen, I made a statement earlier. Some of you are in intense situations that God does not want you to stay in. 
But not everybody's in that state. And so then we play this blame game of, of you and me and start taking a list and why well, you did this, so I have the right to be like this, and you did this, so I'm going to react like this. And because you said this, I reserve and I hold back affection and love. And none of that is the life of Christ, and it shows me that we're not in that communion with him. Because if we were in daily communion, listen, your problem's not outside of you. Your problem is you haven't recognized who's in you and you're not pulling from that reservoir. Because listen, that reservoir is never empty. And it's in you. It's not coming. It's not a place in worship that we try to get to as a body where we're waiting for this love to show up. The love is in you. Which means when you worship, it's a direct response of the communion and unity that you have with him. We're really good on positional truth. I've been seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But we look at that as not a reality. But it is a reality. God, when he looks at you, if you're born again, a lot of us live in shame because we still view ourselves from the old man. We know our struggles and how we've walked and how we've done impure things. So our perspective sees impurity and how God's view of us is impure and he's mad at us wanting us to become pure. But we fail to recognize that if we're in him and he's in us, there's a direct union. And he sees us as his sons and his daughters that are just like him. And he's not impure. And listen, if you could get that working inside of your brain, you could start to look at your failures differently. Because they don't determine who you are. Your identity stays the same. That regardless of all the bad decisions you've made up until this point. If you could recognize God's looking at you as his son and daughter. You could see who you are and your true value. And start to walk out of a lot of these things. But we usually let situations. And man then we. You know let me speak to the young girls in here. Unmarried. Don't ever let a guy. Fulfill a place in you and let him get something from you because he's flattering you with his lips. Can I get a little uncomfortable here? Somebody say glory. If you were to plug into intimacy with God, oh my gosh, listen, men are trained to go after the purity of, 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 of a woman. The world has trained us to be impure and, and do all these ridiculous things. But if, if these girls would be plugged into God in union and intimacy, a guy would come along and he would bat his eyes and say something and it would bounce off them and they'd say, listen, I don't need affection from you right now. I'm in him and he's in me. I'm waiting for the right one that's not going to come and try to take something from me that they don't deserve. Are you listening? Don't sell yourself short. Purity is a very precious thing in the eyes of God because it's who you are. You plug into that reservoir of God in you and you start to let the fullness of love that goes beyond knowledge. It's an intimate relationship where you're in daily communion. And listen, worship has so much to do with this. Worship wasn't a, so much for the congregational that it was all about when we come together, though that's important and I'm all about corporate worship. It was more about you developing in an intimate relationship with God where you carry it everywhere you go. And when you get together corporately, it booms out of you and we're all in this zone of constantly loving on him and him loving on us because we live there. Are you following me? Everybody say amen. Amen. But to know this love that goes beyond knowledge, there's a communion involved. I said yesterday that I wake up in the morning, my first thought is, Father, I thank you that you're in me and I'm in you. I'm starting my day off with my perspective over already being in him. I'm in him. I'm in him. He's in me. I'm not lacking. I know that reservoir and then it fulfills me and then temptations can come my way and I do not even think about going down the direction now because I recognize who's living in me and how he has the power to sustain me. And then my life's not going up and down through failure anymore. My life's consistent and I'm not failing anymore because I know who I am. Are you following me? A few of you are. To know the love of Christ, listen, it passes all knowledge. There's a deeper place that God wants to commune with us. It's not just knowing in your mind. 
There's a love that exists in you that you could tap into through this intimacy with God that's already in you. You're not waiting for it to come. You're not waiting for it to show up. You're not waiting for your circumstances to line up. You're not waiting for change around you. What you're really looking for is to get intimately acquainted with who's already in you because if you do, your whole perspective of life is going to change. And then you're no longer doing as good as everything is around you. You're doing as good as he is in you and you start to change who you are in response to everything around you. We're usually only doing as good as everything around us is. And that's because we don't know who's in us and who we are. And then we find ourselves in situations where our hearts get broken because we get let down by people, because we had our trust and faith in people and not in God. Could you imagine Jesus willfully going to the cross? Listen, there's a place where love that exists in you that you could get to know the fullness of it, that it doesn't matter what someone has done to you. You would have no malice in your heart toward them. You would be only walking in forgiveness and love. There's a place of purity that exists in you right now where if you could recognize your identity, sin would not be a thought in your brain. You wouldn't be trying not to sin. You would be always being righteousness everywhere you go. And sin wouldn't even be a desire that would try to get you off because you'd be so secure in him. It's where temptation doesn't even look the same anymore. Blessed is the man or woman that endures temptation. You can endure the temptation by resisting it, by knowing who you are and who he is. Because his grace empowers you to say no, no matter what it's telling you to do. Most people I know have lived failing to temptation and failing to temptation and failing to temptation. And we're always in this state of failure where we look to God like we don't have what we need because we have not gotten intimately acquainted with him through communion. Because if you do, you'll find you always have everything you need to overcome. I feel like this is one of the best messages I've ever preached. <laughs> There's this love that's in you right now. It's not coming. It needs to come to the fullness, but it's not in a state of lacking. Our understanding has to be plugged in it through communion. Then it goes beyond knowledge and into knowing, knowing that without a shadow of a doubt, God loves me. He loves me. He loves me. I am not a failure. He doesn't look at me with disappointment. He doesn't look at me as a failure. He looks at me with love because love is who I am. It's my identity. He's alive in me and I'm in him. And I see and recognize that which allows me to love you because it's who I am. And my perspective sees it. He's not mad when I fail. He's more concerned with making me realize I'm not a failure, so I stop failing. Most of us keep failing because we don't know that union. We don't know who he is, and our perspective about ourselves is so impure. So we see ourselves as vile and dirty and we're always the problem. But if we get plugged into this intimacy, you realize you're not the problem. God loves you and he changed you. And you really have this love that's working in you that's always booming success. It's an intimate place that lives in you that has everything you need to be who he created you to be because it's who you already are. He loves us. And conviction lives in that place where, listen, conviction should always bring you back into identity, not condemnation. So conviction goes off in you when you start to be tempted about thinking of going in the wrong direction. And all conviction is supposed to do is realign your perspective to remember who you are. So you feel like it's uneasy because you know that you shouldn't go that direction. And God's consistently reminding you that you're a good tree, the planting of the Lord, a tree of righteousness. You're not a bad tree. You don't really bear corrupt fruit. You're a good tree and you're supposed to bear good fruit. Most of us still think we have the capacity to bear bad fruit. So we live in the lie where we're always committing the wrong actions because we can't see that we're a good tree. And if you're a good tree, you could only produce what that tree is going to produce goodness are you following me the gospel is not schizophrenic you're not bipolar you're not dual personalities you're not light and darkness God is light 
Well, if you have fellowship with him, you're going to walk in that light because you see that he in you is light. So that means you are light. And he that followeth him and walks in the light shall not walk in darkness. Not because you're trying not to walk in darkness, but you realize that your light and darkness isn't who you are. So why would you go against your very nature? Because you're light in the Lord. Your love right now, your light right now, you're free right now. Listen, you're really blessed right now. You're not in a state of lacking right now. We think money's our problem. Money's not our problem. We have not gotten intimately acquainted with him. Because if you ever do, you're going to realize you cannot go anywhere where you're not already blessed, whether you have money or not. But that perspective changes you to be able to receive from him. And I promise you, you will never go without. You can't lack in that state. Then the gospel's not about gaining more prosperity like we've made it or gaining more health like we've made it or gaining more freedom like we've made it or gaining more whatever like we've made it. The gospel was always about union with God and who's in you. And if you tap into that, you're not lacking none of those things because you know who you are, who he is, because you're in daily communion with him and it changes your perspective. And it's no longer about attacking problems outside of you. It's all about realizing and recognizing who you already are. Faith thrives there. I've seen it. I've seen my walk be affected by this. Well, you could tell. I could tell you could tell because I could tell. (laughs) Far too long did I live on the other side where I thought that it was all about performance to get to a place in the future, but it was really all about him and me right now. You don't have to perform. Performance is almost an acting. You be. You are love. You don't act like love. You are love. You could only be what you really are, but we don't see it, so then we don't love. Then we still think we're deficient. Then we're tempted, and then we fall to temptation because we feel like we don't what we have what we need. And then we engage God from that perspective and always a state of lacking, thinking he held back something that we needed to overcome. And the only way he was going to give it to you is if you did X, Y, Z perfectly, then it would release his hand to give you what you need. Listen to me, that is not sonship. Are you listening? He gave you everything you needed to win. Our perspective can change when we're rooted and grounded in love but it's being rooted and grounded in who you already are. You're not the problem. You're really the answer because he's in you. We still see ourselves as the problem. I'm weak. No, you're not weak. His strength lives in you. You might be weak in your own ability, but that's just it. His ability is in you. Let's make that switch where we recognize what's working in us. Because his strength is perfected in weakness, so he knew that we could never walk this gospel walk without him. He knew that we were, it was impossible to love without him. He knew that we were destined for hell without him. That's why God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, if you believed in him, listen, says in John, the first chapter, that to you he gave the right to become a child of God. So you believe in him and you become a part of his family. Which means union steps into you, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Listen, it's in you if you got born again. You're connected to him. He's in you and you're in him. He's alive. You became a child of God. You're hooked up in his family. You're a part of the beloved. And from that point forward, he wanted our whole perspective to see ourselves as in him. Not outside, but in him. Not always trying to get in, but in him. Not always trying to become old into the new, but you were made the new to put off the old. She were really made a new creature. But that new creature thrives in that intimate place with God where you commune with him. And in your communion and worship and prayer, but not just prayer, listen, worship is so important. I love you, Father. It's the most basic because it's just as simple as saying, Father, I love you. I love you. 
well, I don't feel anything. It doesn't matter if you could put your faith in perspective that he's in you and you're in him. I guarantee you, you will start to feel something because you'll recognize he's already here. We walk by faith and not by sight, but if our faith could ever be rooted and grounded that he's in us, then he's going to affect our feelings. So for far too long, we've said it's never about feeling anything. Well, it's not about feeling anything. But if he's really in you and you're in union with him, I promise you it's going to affect your emotions if you believe it. So I don't have fear much anymore in my life because I know that perfect love drives out all fear because God's in me. And perfect love is not a state that you attain in the future. It's a state that he put in you that lives right now. So you cannot have fear and torment because you recognize that he's in you and you're in him and you're living in a constant state of communion. Perfect love drives out all fear. It's not a thought in my brain anymore. I'm not insecure about who I am. I'm actually really comfortable in who I am because I know that I am love. Most people think that you're still the problem. I'm a, I can't get alone with myself. It's just it. It's, just, it's not just you. So when you get alone, you're getting alone with God. Then you can start to look at it like you're never alone. So we fill our lives with situations that feed us from distractions of movies and TVs and video games and relationships and any kind of thing that would just satisfy our soul to be content with this place of fear that lives in us because we're not okay being alone because we haven't recognized that we're really never alone. My God, I'm on fire. You're never alone. He never leaves you. He's in you and you're in him, which means when you get alone, that's where you're supposed to thrive in that union and be okay with yourself because you see you're not the problem. <laughs> You'd be okay with yourself if you realize you're not a failure. Well, you might get a little cocky about it. I think we need to bring that back into the body of Christ because most people have a false humility. If you know who you are, you know who you are. You're going to... Expect it to show up everywhere you go. It's not boasting. I don't boast in myself. I boast in Christ in me. And I'm trying to get you to see that Christ is in you. You could boast in him. Then you're not hanging your shoulders all the time. Woe is me. Woe is me. I'm undone. No, you were undone, but he came alive in you. You're not undone anymore. We should be in this constant state of fellowship of knowing that perfect love lives in you. And so we should be wanting to get alone more because we are realizing we're not really alone, but he's with us. So in those times that we're alone from the rest of the world and anything that would feed us, you're plugging into who's in you because you were never really alone. You're just starting to realize he's always been there. And in that intimate development of knowing who he is and who you are, it starts to change what you do because you no longer want to fill your soul with all these things that you thought you needed. Because they don't really mean anything to you anymore. Listen, I don't watch a lot of TV anymore. And it's not because I'm religious about it. It's because I see there's no value in it. Because <laughs> most of what you watch on TV is going to tell you that you're a failure. Everybody's dysfunctional. And you have to do all these evil things. And then we watch people do evil things. And then we get it planted in our brain. that This is how a healthy family should be. But it's a dysfunctional family that you're watching on TV. And it starts to affect your perspective. And then you view it through what you're letting in your life. You unplug from that and you plug into who he is in you and who you are. You start to see all oh, that's worthless. I don't need it in my life. Oh, I'm preaching good. So I don't spend a lot of time watching TV anymore. And it's not because I have to. It's because I'm choosing to. Because I'm in a constant state of communion with knowing who he is in me and who I am. So if I watch anything that violates his nature, I don't want it to come into my eyes. Because I love him and I know who's in me and I know who he is. And he's in me and perfect love is just booming out of me. And there's no place for torment if you recognize that. Then it's no longer about what I could get from you. Too much of our marriages is about what we could get from our spouse instead of loving them. Can I get a little uncomfortable? We demand things like you have to do this, but if you recognize and realize that you're there to love your wife like Christ loved the church, and it would unlock a respect that she would have for you because she would see love that's really, oh. 
but we look at our spouses as if they owe us something, but really they don't owe you anything other than you owing them to love them, which means it was always about them and not about you, but you won't see that unless you see that Jesus is in you. Then you'll start, stop blaming them for all the dysfunction. You might actually start to speak to who they are and say, I know that you're loved just like me. Let me help you see this. <laughs> we could work together. Well, that will only come if you really get intimately acquainted with who he is in you. It could take some time. Everybody say time. But see, time's not the goal. The goal is the rest of your life. <laughs> it's not an hour block that you set aside and for far too long in our faith camps, we've made it about these hour blocks. Like God will only fellowship with you in your four hour prayer time. He'll come out from heaven and reside in that room with you. <laughs> and then we leave him in the room and then we go about our way. We failed to recognize that the communion was always there inside of us and you could tap into it no matter what you're doing. So you never have an excuse of being too busy because he's always with you. Amen. And if you start to live there and fellowship there, I promise you it'll start to get you to dedicate more time alone with him, but you're recognizing it's not because you're seeking him because you think he's apart from you. You want to spend more time with him and shut everything else out because it's just you and him. And it's always been just you and him. And then it changes the way you see prayer because it's no longer about doing X, Y, Z to get. <laughs> it was always about him. It's always about Jesus. He's in you. You're in him. He wants you to get intimately acquainted with the love that passes all knowledge that's turns into an experience that affects your faith, that makes you be consistently loved no matter what's happening in your life. And compassion, listen, you want to talk about miracles. You want to talk about faith works by love. So you want more faith, go after the love that's already in you and get intimately acquainted with it. Don't worry about unbelief. It's going to be dealt with. Because faith works by love, so the more time you spend in that love and intimacy and union with him, you're going to have compassion. You will not walk by someone that's sick without wanting to do something because you recognize God's in you. It's not even you that's going to lay your hands on them and heal them. It's him wanting to burst out of you and give it to them. And then you wouldn't look at yourself as lacking the power like it's my unbelief. No, you're in union with God and he's in you. You never had the power. It was always his spirit that dwells in you, but we haven't gotten intimately acquainted to believe that. So when we pray for someone, we think it's us that's stopping the prayer. He wants to flow through that. If we recognize he's in us, you'd remove yourself from the equation. He's always been there wanting to do something. Your faith can be rooted in that. I promise you it will eradicate unbelief. And unbelief's not really the problem anymore. The problem is intimacy <laughs> and our lack of it. Amen. God didn't want you to be driven to spend time with him because of a problem. He wanted you to be guided to spend time with him through the love that was drawing you. I feel like I can uppercut the devil right now. <laughs> But then it changes your perspective. And then when, when, when you don't get to set aside that time and life happens and then you want to wake up and feel condemned like I missed it again. I don't have the strength. I've never been able to make these decisions. Listen, he's in you. Start with wherever you're at and plug into that communion no matter how busy you are. Set aside that moment in your day where you recognize, Father, you're in me and I'm in you. I love you. We're one. We're in unity. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to know this place that passes knowledge that exists in me that I bless you I worship you that I'm one with you I'm a son and you love me and it starts to cultivate a healthy environment that's drawing you more into intimacy not religious laws and standards that we put on people that you have to pray two hours a day to succeed it was never in the two hours a day he wanted us to see that he was always there so then you start to want to be in a consistent state of prayer because you recognize you're one with him and his love is constantly drawing you. Oh, changes then why you spend time with him because then it's all about him. But not him out there, him in you and you recognize it's no longer you that live 
But Jesus, through that union, the Father, I and them and thou and me, that they would be made one. So Jesus came alive in you, but God was in him. So he and that union just goes, we're never separate from him. Our problem's not outside of us. Our problem's not sitting next to us. Our problem is that we've failed to realize who we are and develop in that intimacy. Because if we ever did, I promise you, that's where faith lives to change everything. Because love will consistently wear down any problem that stands in its way. (laughs) And if there was ever anyone that ran as far away from God, it was me. But his love stayed consistent and it constantly, constantly, constantly wore me down till eventually it completely got me. (laughs) He stays the same. Well, then we treat people bad because we think God treats us bad when we mess up. So we have a view of God that if I fail you, that you're mad at me today. So if you fail me, I'm mad at you today. But if we recognize that he's always only coming from a place of love and not anger, and he's wanting us to see who we are, then I'd know he's consistent. It would make me consistent that no matter how you treat me, I treat you different. Because I'm not changing, because he never changed. Then we get rooted and grounded in him, which has always had the same perspective about us. He loves us. He loves us. And in that love, he wants us to change our perspective. But if we think he changes and we could change and I'll change depending on how you're treating me. But God doesn't change. Listen, he hates sin. It's, not, it's a part of his character. Light and darkness go opposite directions. He's more mad at most people sinning because they don't know who they are than he is about them sinning. Did you get that? And in that union with him and intimacy, you would realize more who you are. You're not going to do the action because it's not coming from a place inside of you. And if you ever do the action, once you come to this understanding, but I'm convinced that most people haven't come to it yet. But if you ever really truly understand who you are in God and who he is and you've thrived in that intimacy, then you choose to live in sin from that point. We're talking about a whole nother ball game. Let me preach some hellfire and brimstone. But the problem usually is, is we've been so slaughtered by our own doctrines that we've just been contained in this place where everybody has to fail. And we thrive on failure. Then we look at how you're doing and how you're doing and we gauge ourselves because no one's really making it. And then the consensus of the doctrine comes to be a theology of knowledge without no repentance and lifestyle that goes with it. It's because we fail to recognize who's in us. He's alive. He changed our very nature. The power plan of love lives in us. I'm not condoning sin at all. If you can get what I'm saying, it would liberate you to see who you are clear, to be able to start to put off sin. The problem's not the action. It's the place. So whatever problem you keep doing, if you focus on who God made you, you are light, you are righteous, you are holy, you are love. Live in that place of communion with him and intimately get acquainted with that through communion with him. You're going to see yourself like that. Faith can be your first response, not your second response. So we think doubt, doubt, doubt. Well, we still doubt because we're not in intimacy. Faith thrives in intimacy so you could believe before you doubt. Most people don't because they haven't gotten rooted and grounded in that place. Are you following me? Whether it's sin, whether it's lack of faith, whether it's depression, whether whatever it is, you could fill in anything there and we can always look for an answer outside of us and someone else to contain the power, but it's always going to be found in who Jesus made you. And listen, Jesus said that they shall know the truth and it's the truth. Listen, nothing else has the power to make you free other than the truth of what his word is. Which means if you know that truth and your perspective and how you view your life, it's going to liberate you to be able to walk differently. It's who you are. It's what's in you. Oh, I spend lots of time in worship. I'm an advocate for it. I don't spend time in worship to get anything from God. I spend time in worship because I want to tell him I love him. I love you. Oh, but in that I've discovered that he speaks back instantly, but I love you. (laughs) 
No, but I love you. Yeah, but I loved you first, and you're loving me because I first gave you that love because I made you love to love me. (laughs) Then you're responding from grace. You're responding from what he's given you, and it's then overtaking you. Because he, listen, at the end of the day, he's always going to get the credit. He's the one that did it. But I'm getting more intimately acquainted with that, that it's changed my whole perspective. And you could too. So all throughout my day now, even when I travel and preach, I'm driving, man, I'm telling God I love him. Father, I love you. I love you. I love you. Then you're driving around Iowa when it's winter, and I don't see dead sticks and no leaves. I see beauty in it. (laughs) I see me in a deer stand waiting for a deer to (laughs) shoot. Oh, sorry. Some of you might be anti anyway. We won't go there. Listen, somebody's killing the meat that you're eating. Somebody say glory. (laughs) Oh, to forbid to eat with meats is the doctrine of devils. (laughs) My perspective is not seeing the woe of how we've always made the woes of everything around us, but it starts to change and you could see God in everything. Because you see things differently because you are the one that's changed. Everybody say worship. Worship. It's so vital for this. To know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. The more time you get intimately acquainted with it. You could pray too. Listen, I'm all about praying in the spirit. He that prays in an unknown tongue, his spirit is edified. You cannot pray in the Spirit one second without your spirit starting to be in this direct communication with God where He's wanting to get you more acquainted with who's in you. But it's always about Him. And the more you pray, the more you should recognize, I'm in Him, He's in me, I'm going to be this everywhere I go. All these keys and tools that we've preached, but we compartmentalize them in these dogmatic times that you have to do and so it's beating our brain that we have to do these things and when we don't do them that we're a failure and God's mad at us but let the revelation spill over that he was never mad at you he loves you he's in you and he wants you to see who you are and live from that place then when you make a mistake his love is able to correct you even more because you realize he was not mad at you Whom the Father loves, He's going to chasten. Love and correction go hand in hand. So love corrects you from the position of I made you my son and my daughter and I'm trying to tweak your perspective to see it so that you will produce the fruit that's already working in you by walking in your true identity. Oh, it thrives in intimacy. I love preaching. I love it. I love it. I'm called to do it. I'm going to do it the rest of my life. There's something that I love more than preaching. And that's spending time with the one that teaches me all things. (laughs) And I never, listen, I don't read my Bible or spend time with God for you. (laughs) I never have. I've spent it for him because I love him. Not trying to get a message to preach. I love him. And in that, I'm I'm, I'm learning who he is. To where then I can adequately teach who he is. (laughs) I don't spend time with him for any other reason that I love him and he loves me, but then I recognize I'm love and I can't help but love you. Listen, you can't put that kind of love out. It's not controllable. And it's alive in you. Everybody say, it's in me. <laughs> this love is in me. Is in you. Everybody say that I'm in him. I'm in him. He's in me. He's and we are, one. we are one. Oh, everybody say, I've been born again. I'm in the family of God. I'm accepted in the beloved. God sees me as light. He doesn't look at me as darkness. He looks at me as light in the Lord. So I can see myself as light. And then I will walk as a child of light. Because it's my true identity. Then I'm not a failure. I'm not really broken. That I'm complete in Him. And in Him, I have all ability to overcome any deficiency. Because I'm not deficient. If He's in me, He's supplying all that I need. So I'll get intimately acquainted with that. 
because it's in me already. It's who I am already. I'm just going to believe it more. And I'm going to believe him more. I'm going to love him more because he loves me. 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 He's in me. And that love is going to come out because it's who I am. Let's all stand.